Costa. Hello, Paul. How are you? Welcome back, my man. Thanks for having me again. First guest I've had on that's come back because we just didn't get through everything that I wanted to get through last week and people need a break from you because your, <laughs> your energy is too high. Your wife's told me that before. Yeah, I sometimes need a break from myself. Yeah. Made a quick recap, like for those that didn't hear the first episode, we talked about your meteoric rise from working in a local seafood cafe, restaurant, takeaway in Maroubra through to building a a serious eight-figure seafood wholesaling business that was supplying some of the best restaurants in Sydney to the implosion on the back of like the rest of the world, just this debt binge that you had. There's been a lot of feedback, most of it, in fact, all of it that I've seen on the show that only went live this morning, um, sorry, yesterday morning. How have you felt, man? Like you watched it, you listened to it with your family. Well, Did it bring up good emotions, <clears throat> bad emotions? Uh, uh, it's a good question. I didn't think you'd ask. I mean, uh, uh, for me, it... Um, I've, I've listened to it several times because uh, even so many years later, I, I, I'm looking for, you know, answers as to what I did that that, that led to what happened. Um, mm. And, you know, whether the feedback that comes back is good or bad, I'm willing to accept whatever that may be because at the end of the day, I can understand why a lot of people, especially those who don't know me, would think what a dickhead. And, 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 I even think that about myself or did mm. uh, in hindsight. So for sure, uh, I just hope that with all that we've discussed and talked about and me sort of purging and talking about my life over the last 25 years or whatever it was, I just hope that a lot of people, and I have had direct messages from people who say that they're in their 20s and they're trying to forge a career and mm. they picked up some stuff out of that 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 gave them perspective and context and I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, but I also I th I think one of my messages for those younger people that are listening to it and looking for perhaps the playbook of you know you did it that way and blew it up so I need to do it this way is that sometimes we all just need to make mistakes and that's part of being human and part of being a particularly adventurous and entrepreneurial person like you are. Look, that's spot on because you know there is no playbook. There are mentors and there are lots of people. Those people that are giving advice in business today are people that are most likely been there, done that, mm. uh, mistakes and all. Um, and I firmly believe that you can't really advise anybody mm. because there's so many variables. It boil, boils down to personality, mm. boils down to timing, it boils down to an era, a generation, so many different things. How can you advise? Yeah. Somebody so someone like myself had to go through what I went through to be. You wouldn't have listened. Well, I never did. Yeah, uh, I, I never really did. I, I, I was always confident that my view on things and take on things was the right way. Yeah. Do you listen now? Do you think you're a little bit more ready to? Yeah. Take advice from people. I I, I definitely am, and it's actually it, it's something that that I'm not used to yet. So I've been. Uh, listening to people for the last 10 years and I specifically put things and ideas on uh, on the back burner for a long time mm -hmm. before I engage uh, and, and I thoroughly look through things and get advice and whatnot and and that's the biggest change that's happened to me to the point where I don't know myself anymore mm -hmm. I'm not the risk taker anymore I'm not the person that just goes out and does stuff. I'm not the invincible mm. con that I knew, and and it's scary for me because I'm 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 not comfortable. <laughs> I'm not really that comfortable with it, to be honest. But maybe you do know yourself. You know, you say I don't know myself anymore. Maybe the fact is you actually do know yourself. So having that gap between thought and action is just that pure self awareness of before I used to think and do and sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't and it, you know, late yeah. 40s, you can't be yeah, that reckless that, anymore. That's, that's what it boils down to. I, you're right. I mean, you, you know, I have to play it safe now. I, I You know, I'm almost 50. Um, I've had my opportunities and my, my, my time as a young guy doing, you know, the reckless and the invincible things and, and I've got a family, you know, who rely on me heavily and, 
you know, I, I can't just continue doing things the way I did. I really have to analyze intrinsically every move I make. Mm -hmm. and, and if I had another maybe 50 years or so, then maybe I, I'd go back to doing what I did, but just yeah. better. Yeah, no, I get it. <laughs> For those that, that don't remember, you, after the business blew up and you had the white night sail in and, and buy you out, you left and went to Greece to recover, rest, and, and ended up staying for three and a half years before coming back to Sydney and not to become a fishmonger again but to become a butcher yeah. and to work with your best mate for, you know, the vast majority of your life, Anthony Baharage. What was the thinking? Like did you look at Vix as a bigger version, a more structured version of what you did? You knew Anthony. He was a, an incredible entrepreneur but also someone that was a risk taker. Like why did you want to come back but come back and, and do something in a completely different protein? I think that the answer to that is, is the fact that um, my time had expired as a – a uh, corporate person. So I, I obviously three and a half years was the end of my tether in terms of what I I wanted to achieve in that arena. Why uh, do you say that then? Man? Why you got bored? I'll or? tell you why. Well, well, it's a combination of boredom. It's a combination of lacking the excitement that I always had. Mm. Uh, and through Anthony and knowing what he was capable of and where he wanted to go, I felt that. Uh, th th there was a, a, an opportunity for me to relive um, all that that mm -hmm. I did before and 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 do it through a, a different protein. But um, you got to remember that it didn't happen straight away. We were talking about it for a long time mm -hmm. because take uh, a step back. I had just taken a family of three, four people, dependents, all back to. Yeah, all to a, an overseas country now and, and trying to find our feet. So th there was no intention initially of but ever Tula looking wanted, back. But your wife wanted to come home, yeah? She did, but after year one, she was already- But three, she was getting settled and not, you wanted no, to uproot no, her again. Actually, uh, uh, yeah. But after year one, she wanted to come home, but after year three, she was- she, finally she, settled. She, she, she was. She was. She had friends, groups of fucking wild people, ride being with you, man. School mums, this, that, the other. Of yeah. course, you know she. She didn't want to just pick up and come back, which is why I, I made a deal with Anthony, and, and that deal was that that I give twelve months of my life uh, uh, as a trial basis mm. to determine whether I wanted to bring my family back to Sydney, and and, and so that, you came back on your own. Yeah. So that twelve month w w went into overtime and. It was almost sixteen months, which While was the another. Was still yeah, in so that was another hard part of my life. Did you go back? Or yeah, so if to to get, to get down to the nitty gritty, when Anthony and I came to a deal, which uh, was I come to Vix me and I'll give you a hand for twelve months, and in that twelve month period, I'll know whether I really want to come back. Yeah. So it was almost a temporary uh, move. So I, here I am three and a half years into my new life. Uh, it took me that long to, to sort of get used to being there. Mm. And I jumped on an aeroplane. I flew to Sydney and I'll never forget landing here. It was really late at night and I went over to Anthony's and, you know, we greeted each other and a big hug and whatever and then I went back to my in-laws, which is where I was staying at the time. And I knew I was here for a good 12 months I was without my kids and, and at, at that point in time I had – my kids were all under 10 – you know, I had a 10, 11-year-old kid, a 5-year-old mm. and a 1-year-old. Mm. So all – you know, for that period I knew it was going to be tough and every four months I'd go back for two weeks exactly and then I'd fly back to Sydney to another four months and then I'd go back to my family for two weeks. So I did that for 15 months and the reason it went for 15 months or 16 months is because I couldn't make up my mind on the 12 month. But I owed Anthony an answer. So I made a decision and I flew back for the final time in February of 2000, was it 2013 and I packed up, put my family in, in the car and my dad took us to the airport and we waved goodbye. What was it, Con, that, that made you finally decide that you wanted a career – 
and a career working in meat, not well, working in in land meat, not in seafood. Because it's like that quote out of the Godfather. You know, I can't even remember how it goes. I watched it so many times, but it's like you know, I got dragged back into it mm. um, because at the end of the day, that's what I'm. That's what I'm all about. That's what I'm made of. So why did I enter the industry in the first place? Was the same reason that I re-entered it through Anthony the second time, mm. and you know what? Twelve months of it—that was probably the, some of the hardest months of my life, being so alone. Yeah, I was going to ask Be- you—you you must have been super well, lonely. Well, I was. I mean, yeah. seven days a week, I threw myself into Vic's meat. Mm. I came here in the middle of the night, and I left in the middle of the night. I was doing fifteen to seventeen hours a day, you know. And then on Saturday it was half a day, but by the end of it, I was annihilated. So I'd go home and absolutely smashed for yep. you know the remainder of the week. And then but isn't that just another form of self medication? Like when for, for some it is, yeah, yeah. But for you too, for me I it was, yeah. of course. Well, I, I, you know, I, I don't know what it is. I mean, look, uh, it's it's hard to sort of describe. A lot of people say to me, "Why, why do you do so much? Why do you work so hard? Why do you work so many hours? Mm. Why do you do so much?" And it's like I don't know. I love it. I just really love it. So I, when I, <laughs> I remember being on the airplane flying to Sydney to come back, and um, I remember saying to Anthony, "Mate, you really need to help me understand the meat business before I jump in." The the, the position was general manager, yeah. looking after all the brands, you know, and I within internal focus or customer facing everything. everything. So, no, it was internal, internal so mainly operational, yeah. And a lot of it was expansion into the various things that Anthony wanted to achieve, including the design of this factory, the here facility, in Mascot. and the uh, market day. And oh, fixed mark, meat market, market day! Yeah, market day was another beast altogether. Yeah. But all of that stuff, I was yeah. involved in every single part. So I wanted some sort of handover, or I wanted some sort of training, or whatever you want to call it. But that never happened. So I remember being on the airplane coming to Sydney with I printed out the entire website. And going through every single aspect of that website for mm. the 24-hour trip that that, that the the, uh, the ride to Sydney was from Larnaca, Cyprus, and you know I came here and Anthony was, you know, we were just excited to be back together again and all that sort of stuff, and and I never got a handover from Anthony, so I prepared my own training regime, mm. and I, I I understood that the business was made up of X, Y, and Z components, and I immersed myself in each of those components over a sort of like two, three-week period in each each component. So warehousing, yeah. production, purchasing, sales, uh, you know, just just all that all that sort of stuff. Can I ask, you, you, you'd been in and around the business for the 15-odd years that had been in existence back then. How different was the shiny ex- reputation and exterior of the business versus the challenges that you faced internally? So, mate, you know, look. The, no as, sugar coating. No, Don't no, be politically as, correct. As, as an outsider looking into Vic's meat, um, the, the the sort of view that you get is it's it's a five star operation. Yeah. And you know what? It, as an insider, it is a five star operation. But uh, uh, you know, with Anthony at the helm and directing the the where we're going, there's always change, and that change you know, happens at a million miles an hour and, mm. and, and there's a lot of change going on and all multifaceted. It's not, yeah, strategically it's all about taking the business in one direction. Yeah. But there's so many different, there was so many different moving parts that it wasn't a simple fix because the, 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 the business was moving from, you know, your standard food service operation to an international sort of platform mm. with all that was going on and he wanted to do it all at once. So for me, you, you know, the, the, my experience in the four years of being involved at Vic's Meat, I say to anyone, that even as a hard worker that I've always been, nothing will prepare you for Vic's Meat. Well, mm. nothing would prepare you for Vic's Meat when I was yeah. here. So I always think that they were the hardest years of my life in an operational role uh, and they far, uh, you know, superseded anything that I've ever seen in the past because of the amount of change that was going on and that yeah. Anthony wanted to happen very quickly. So if you think about it and break it down, we we moved, you know, we were we were 
in a business that was growing. Yeah. So from a sales perspective, the business was growing. Yep. It was growing in a food service uh, on a food service level. Yep. So more of what we're currently doing, which is restaurant and hotel and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, service. We were growing as a retailer, so Victor Churchill was always was already running, mm -hmm. um, and there was work to do there. But then we were doing, you know, on the back banner, we were talking about, you know, we had Vic's Meat Market Day going, and we knew that this thing was, you know, had enormous potential. So th there was that going, and where would that go in the future in terms of a broader uh, business idea? Yeah. There was also the whole uh, uh, idea of moving uh, uh, the servicing of Melbourne from Sydney to yeah, a more to permanent Melbourne. solution Melbourne. based in Melbourne. So yeah. we did that as well. Yeah. So we went from moving pallets of meat two or three, two days a week to three days a week to then permanently basing it in Melbourne, which is the right thing to, which was the right thing to do, and the best thing we ever did. Yeah. Plus. You know, if we wanted to achieve all these other things, then we needed to, to to grow the footprint of the factory, and we needed to raise the bar in terms of if we were going to do it, then we needed to do it properly. And Anthony had this mega idea of, you know, one way in and one way out traffic in terms mm -hmm. of servicing all aspects of the business through here in Mascot, yeah. and that that design was those blueprints were something that you know very similar to a Victor Churchill. Uh, concept in terms of um, how big and grand and sort of dreamlike they were, mm. uh, they had never been done before. So you know, uh, you know, we, that that so that was all going on at once. Yeah, all of it. It never it never stopped. So I mean, I, I can't even really. You did know. you feel out of your depth, Con? Because it's like it sounds I, 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 stressful I did. just at, just, at, just at listening times, to it, mate. Look. I felt out of my depth in the sense that I didn't know shit about me. Yeah, but you shouldn't have to. You're a general manager. It yeah, shouldn't matter. I, I shouldn't, but I want to know everything. Yeah, I, well, maybe I, that's part of the problem. Maybe it is. Yeah. Maybe it is. Maybe yeah. it was. Anthony wants to do everything. That's part of the problem. You wanting to know everything <laughs> is part of yeah, the problem. Yeah, I, I mean, being a general manager in, in, for me wasn't just about in, in, in directing traffic. It was about intimately understanding every aspect of the business so I can do my job to the very highest level and mm. I'm doing it for a mate. It was, it's even different than doing it for me. I've, Unpack that for me. You're working okay. for your best mate. Okay. Unpack was that. It, was it was – because it, it must be weird. It is weird but it's it's there's parts of it you don't even know probably. So here I am working for myself is different to working for a mate because I will probably let things slide sometimes doing it for me. Yeah. When I'm doing it for someone – uh, outside of myself and, and someone important to me. For me, the standard was even higher because yeah. I'm not delivering for me. I'm delivering for somebody else. I'm handling somebody else's money. I'm handling somebody else's assets. Yeah. It's more important no, than just that. handling my own. What about what about the – sometimes you must have felt like Anthony was making – the wrong decision, taking on too much. Did I, you ever bite your tongue? Where no, in I, I retrospect told him. you should no, you told him? Okay. I, I, I've told like every step of the way. I'd see. I I wasn't. I'm not a yes guy, and even for a best mate, I'm not going to say yes to something. Yeah. If I say yes to Anthony, uh, for every decision that he wants to, or every path that he wants to travel down, mm. if I don't challenge uh, that uh, idea. Yeah. If I believed it needed challenging based on my own experiences and understanding of the market or people or and it always impacted people. Mm. It impacted two major well, – many things but it impacted immediately the people that worked here Yeah, and because uh, we were burning people out like there was no tomorrow and 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 it impacted our customers. So, you, you know, sometimes I even wonder how we kept our customers with the amount of change that we put them through because we couldn't hide it. There was so much going on that the the error uh, number and capacity and 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 what was phenomenal, mm. phenomenal. I won't even go into the detail, but yeah. there was a lot going on. But you know what I've learned out of this whole thing? You, you you can either push, hustle, and make shit happen while the iron's hot, yeah, or you can map it out and do it over a period of ten. Because what we did in four years is probably in most people's business career a lifetime's worth. You, you know, you could probably do what we did in 10, mm. if not 15. Get it. 
I, I'm serious. I'm not. I'm not even. I'm not even exaggerating. I reckon what we did, most people wouldn't do in in a whole lifetime of business in one one generation, let alone in four years. Yeah. So so we 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 took a a, a little factory in Mascot. We spent fourteen million bucks doing the research, the design, and the implementation and execution. Right. We took a little market day that was run out of the back of the warehouse that took you know. I don't know if we should be talking numbers, but it was taking a lot. It was taking fuck all, and then it, it turned into a monster. Yeah, and then and and that was all in the same space as doing food service. So you mm. got to understand, we're not only doing numbers; we're physically moving people and product and equipment around to make it happen. Mm. Um, we're so we're growing as a business in 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 that regard. We're growing as a business in sales. We're building a new factory where we've just opened up Melbourne. So I'm in Melbourne every two three weeks. Making sure that's that's you know running from scratch to what it is, and 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 we've just designed a, a, a Vix meat market in Piedmont because the opportunity came up yeah. and we couldn't let it go, and it made a lot of sense because mm. then we could transfer what we're doing here in on Saturdays into a full time operation, uh, you know, on, on a bigger platform. Yeah, and there was Victor Churchill going. I mean, who? How do you do all that? But can I ask? Because it does sound like I get it, and I get that opportunities arise do you think though that you've jumped out of the plane and then you're trying to figure out how you can retrofit a parachute because it kind of feels like (laughs) you had these ambitious minds all running at things but there was no clear plan other than this desire to be the best this desire to be the market leader as opposed to going if this was done back to your point before that if you mapped it out you know, it might have taken a little bit longer to get the start date right, but the the finish, which is still going on, might have happened a little bit sooner. You know that old parable or whatever the right word for it is. If you've got to chop down a, a, a tree, then spend 70% of your time sharpening the axe and then chop it down as opposed to just hacking with a, a, a blunt axe. You know, people leaving, all of that. I'm just playing yeah, devil's advocate, Con. I mean, no, no, you're right, mate. Look, these are all facts. Yeah. I mean, I ended up moving on four years later. I didn't Why'd f- you move on, man? Well, two things, two reasons. So one, um, three. One, I don't like to say this because, I, you know, I, I don't think that uh, I could ever run out of steam, but I think I, I, I was tired. Yeah. I think that I was physically exhausted, mentally burnt out. Because yeah. you know we we did a lot. Secondly, um, I think we did. We we got to where we needed to go in terms of what the, the you know the plans were or, or 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 the execution of what what he set out to do. We did. Yeah. And thirdly, he's a he's a very close friend, best mate. Yeah. And I didn't want to see our relationship potentially go to shit. Because was it getting a bit? Stressed? I think I think that if you look at the position we were in. Um, uh, in the fourth year of my time being here, uh, we were under enormous pressure, yeah. massive pressure, financial pressure. Well, or? well, we we've done everything physically that we needed to do, but now we had to make it work. Yeah. Um, you know, how do you plan for change? We we went through all that as well, and 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 uh, like I I was running out of my own personal patience, and I thought, you know what, I, I've got the shits with my burnout phase that I'm going through, I can see Anthony's really uptight as well. And, mm. you know, I, I, now that we've built this house, I think it's time for me to move on. I never felt, no one ever made me feel that way uh, or whatnot. I just felt that it was time for me to go. And looking back on it, I'm glad I did because, you know, it, it's a friendship that I want to protect for yeah. the rest of my life. I, I don't want to see, you know, something like that go to waste or Get yeah. it. How big an impact did the family have in that? Like you've got Vic, you have Anita, you've got Anthony. Like is it hard yeah. being the, Massive. the the fourth person in Huge. that? Yeah. The, like, like probably for reasons that you wouldn't even think of. So uh, I've got Vic running downstairs. I've got Anthony, you know, puppeteering and I've got Anita, a very important cog in the wheel of things and, and purchasing probably the most impo- one of the most important mm-hmm. facets is, is 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 what you're buying and you know how you're buying it people think that buying is is an easy thing but it's not cuz you know there's so much planning involved 
and you can never really see the future because it's hard to, to gauge where we're going from month to month. But ultimately, um, uh, they're a family and I'm taking instructions from three different heads. Mm. So I'm trying to be that conduit, that buffer, that suspension that, that you know, absorbs the impact so that it doesn't, you know, um, it. Uh, ripple down the rest of the business. So, you know, Anthony's got his views, Vic's doing his thing, Anita's got her own sort of concerns and I'm trying to keep that, keep that all to, it's a difficult thing to do because you don't have one boss, mm. you don't have one person directing traffic, you've got three. And it's not that they're all telling me what to do, it's they're all telling me how they feel about what needs to happen. So you've got even amongst them, uh, you know, a disagreement. Big time, yep. big time. So can I ask, and it's a controversial question, do you believe that, and you know Anthony as well as anyone on this planet, maybe outside Rebecca, his wife, do you believe that Anthony doing it on his own without – Vic and Anita, hypothetically, would allow him the runway to truly unlock the the value in this business for the very reason that you've just flagged, that when you've got three very strong and important people in a business, sometimes there are too many cooks? I mean, I don't, I, Paul, that's a difficult question because I, 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 I've been absent from the business for-, for Just, just, for, just don't be politically correct. From your gut feel, given yeah. the, the talent that he's got- do you think it would give him the runway to to really unlock the value? Well, that, look, that's one way to look at it. The other the other way to look at it is when is, there's one person directing as opposed to two or three, um, then obviously the runway is clear, isn't it? You can mm. do whatever you want. So the question is, uh, if you've tried everything to you know um, look at other solutions uh, along the way. So for example, if you take Vic uh, as one example. Um, if if discussions were had in and around Vic's role in the business uh, and the future and whatnot, and 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 it didn't go where it needed to go, then potentially there there, there should be a conversation in and around Vic, uh, you know, retiring or whatever it might be. But again, that's a family conversation, and maybe no, Vic- that's a business conversation. I think this is the thing. There, there's well, a, there, well, there's the a hard syndrome thing called Paul. founder syndrome. I know it's a hard thing. I'm not, you know, I think without doubt it's probably. The thing that family businesses, the most difficult decision they ever face. But there's a there's an economic theory called founder syndrome where an organization outgrows the experience of one or more of the founders and that realization that if you don't change that, then things will implode. And sometimes that's just the reality. And you see you see it you see it time and time again. Yeah. But to your point, it is it is really difficult for someone that's poured their heart, soul and risked their entire financial freedom on a business to go, you know what, I've kind of, the business has outgrown me and it's time for me to step aside and have confidence in my partner, my son and and let him do what he needs to do. Look, I, I, I think there's an absolute right you know, way of doing it. Um, we talked about it about five or six years ago. I remember the first time the family all went to Croatia together and I was on my own, you know, running the whole show for, you know, six weeks or whatever mm-hmm. it was. And I, I, you know, Vic will tell you himself that, um, you know, he, he, the business runs differently without him because you got to understand like Vic's old school, the way he does things is different to the way things are done today. In, in in not every way, in every aspect of a business, but in yeah. many. So, you know, he'll tell you himself that maybe potentially, you know, he disagrees with the way things are done today in certain aspects of the business. And but, you know, so be it. Mm. And 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 it's not just in families that it happens. It happens in all partnerships. Yeah. You know, we've all got different minds and we've all got different ambitions and understandings and and everyone sort of plays to their own strengths. And yeah. I think it's it's even more difficult though when it's particularly father son because this is mine you know and without pretending to be a psychologist that Vic looks at Anthony and 
without doubt loves and respects him as much as any person on the planet, but also worries, doesn't get the risk appetite that Anthony has, went to China, went yeah. to Singapore, yeah. lost his house yeah. that everyone knows about. And so he worries that without his rational mind and sensibility yeah. and conservatism of just do what you need to do, but he doesn't truly understand the drive that is Anthony and that he will never be comfortable just with the status quo. And I think that's Vic's only concern, that if he could walk away and see Anthony rise and shine, which without doubt he would do if that ever came to it, but I think it worries him that without him around that that, that wouldn't be the case and that he would make decisions that – perhaps put him at risk again and to, yeah. to your case yeah. con you know all of us of get same. to an age you get to yeah. an age you you can't necessarily bounce back yeah you can't it's taken me 10 years and I'm, I'm 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 okay but you'll never be able to recover you know all that all that work and effort but you, i disagree you, with that but anyway <laughs> Well, you probably will. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to say, but it's at just the, harder at this age. Yeah, hundred percent. At the end of the day, though, I mean, you can understand why Vic feels that way, and maybe you do need some people to pull you back, in 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 many ways, because if if along the way somebody gave Anthony, you know, the full green light from the beginning to do whatever he wanted, potentially his personality and his overzealous, you know, ambitions and whatnot may have gone into a different path. I don't know. You don't know that. Yeah. No one knows that. Yeah. Maybe having his father by him so, by his side for so long has um, rubbed off on Anthony to a degree and given him some curbing, uh, you know, type mm. of. Uh, yeah. I think there's a subtle difference between someone questioning, like rationally questioning and saying, show me the return on investment from it and being negative to it. Yeah. And I think that's the – the, the challenging thing for yeah. both of them that one well, comes from a point of the industry's changed and it's fucked and yeah. all those things to one going, of course it's changed. Everything changed, you know? Yeah. But Kodak didn't see that change yeah, coming no, sh and surely. you know and there's proof. For and there's sure. proof. Yeah. Um why'd you go back to fish, man? You left here and decided to go back to what blew up your family uh, yeah. and your fortune and not blew up your family well, but blew up blew, blew up everything that you had yeah why go back to it i mean it's like it's in your blood it's or? like i said earlier in the first part where i'm restless most of the time and i'm always looking for you know something different to do but it's it's more than that for me you you, you did say something that triggered uh, a response it may be a redemption thing or it could be, be me saying to myself, well, what am I good at? Mm. Where are my contacts? What am I best at? And I understand seafood better than I understand anything else. Yeah. So why wouldn't I look at the time frame of four years and three and a half prior to that and say, okay, I've been out of the game for seven and a half years. Maybe it is time for me to come back. But you know what? There were other things as well. There were clear indications that the industry was changing in a big way. And I felt that it was time for me to jump on the wagon again because I just saw those opportunities. And what was what were the big changes in particular? I mean, there were some big announcements going on in terms of you know some major competitors or people in the food service arena of the seafood uh, um, uh, sector that that were being sold, and I just knew that you know that would shake the ground mm. and i knew other stuff as well that i thought potentially this might be my my cue to go in again and you know what i wasn't wrong mm. i was very very right and um i i, I don't regret it so there, there were two reasons one were the clear indications and what i'd been sort of hearing in the industry were going on yeah and secondly, I just thought it was time to move on. Who were the big players, Costa? And if 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 who we looked were? at no, who if we look at the seafood food service sector in yep. Sydney, how big is it? Do you reckon, from a dollar's perspective? Look, it, it, in terms of food service, two hundred million, three hundred, uh, four hundred. I, I reckon no, probably nowhere near that figure. But it, in terms of Sydney, and in terms of the 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 the, the focus that I have, which is premium, yeah, there's probably about. 100 million. 
100 million shared a, a, between a, a, who? 100 million. Well, Martins that you, you, well, you're, well, you're we're, involved we're, with? Well, we're, we're a. We're a who are know, the other big players? Da Costi, Tassel, Costa. yep. that's a big one. Yeah. Uh, Paulos Brothers, who recently acquired, or not so recently, maybe two or so years ago, acquired Jotto. There's mm. another big one. Yeah. How do you um, differ, how how do the four of you just use those four as an example? Yeah. How do you differentiate yourselves outside of the relationships that you clearly have with chefs? Because I think this is one of the big challenges with the with the yeah. industry is that if everyone has access to the same produce, and maybe you have exclusive yeah. arrangements yeah. with some people, you assume that there's a degree of process and business discipline that goes into certain businesses but maybe yep. that is a unique selling proposition for some businesses that they're more turnkey the only other thing that really is there is the the relationships that the people that are at the front line doing and the marketing that people like you have a real passion for but do you see it the same way mate like do you have a unique selling proposition that when you go to see a a chef, you say this is why we're different to De Costi. So, it, 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 it's it's probably a combination of more than one thing, but the two big ones are the following: relationships is a huge thing. Yeah, I mean, even myself, who's been in the industry for so many years, and some of the chefs I know personally and have dealt with for many years, have forged relationships with other people in my absence. Yeah, I can't expect those people to come back to me simply because. Uh, we know each other and we had some drinks and I supplied them for 10 years. They, I respect that. So the relationship thing's huge. Mm. But the other thing is it's the offering. It's who you are and what drives your whole proposition. So me, as who I am, Costa Nemitsis, um, you know, I am a certain person that uh, won't compromise on certain things and that that's a whole list of stuff. And that whole list of things together is what brings me the the loyalty. But are they like business process they things are and partly quality? Bi- yeah, so, so why does that matter whether it's con or your underlinging or because well not all CEOs are the same. Sure. Not all general managers are the same. Yeah. Not everyone approaches things the way I do or you do. Yeah. So, you know, they go back to uh key uh character traits. So as an individual, I don't fuck around. I don't do things by the half. Not that if you have a look at Anthony, he doesn't do anything uh, 80%. It's all 100%. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm very much the same, which is why we sort of get along so well because we believe that certain things just can't be played with. And that 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 is a very important part of attracting customers. Um, so those who deal with me, mm. trust me, that trust is based on uh, the proof that I've done over the years and my track record. But also, they know when they hear the name Costa, yep. they're not going to get fucked around. But if they were getting, just, again, I'm just playing devil's advocate. If they were getting the product that they wanted, the quality that they wanted, the time that they wanted it, the customer service follow up and things. Well, if why? They were getting, why would it? Why would it matter, <laughs> man? Like, it, well, well, that's the thing, Paul. They can't. Not everybody can. Not everybody can get deliveries on time. You know why? Because not everybody's prepared to do what I am, which is, you know, do whatever it takes and whatever's necessary to honour that one KPI. Yeah. Um, uh, but that not, shouldn't be your problem, though. If the business is set up properly, then the it's, infrastructure it's, of the it's, business it's, should get it it's, there. It's not so simple because… Like Jeff Bezos doesn't deliver a package for Amazon. Uh, some businesses can't be replicated in the same fashion. And why I know you you'll disagree… So, I don't necessarily disagree. I just want want you to explain to me. So, so one of the main benefits uh, and 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 negatives of of being who I am are are, are the hands on approach that I have. So that's held me back from a lot of things, but it's also given me a lot of things. When I weigh it all up, it's given me more than it's taken from me. So maybe uh, you just enjoy it. A maybe, lot, maybe, man. maybe I do. Maybe yeah. I do. Maybe yeah. I do. Which is why I get up at one o'clock in the morning yeah. every day. Which is why I want to be a part of the production, a part of the the operational stuff, a part of sales, and a part of marketing. And yeah. I want to be a part of everything. Sure. I, I don't want to do it all because I can't. But I want to be involved with it all, and I am. And th- I think that my hands-on approach to tackling fresh seafood daily gives me an advantage. 
So while other people are getting dressed in their suits and ties or their business shirts and they're jumping in their car and buying their first coffee, I've already done five hours of hardcore touch, feel, see. I can tell you yeah. when you, when my customer is going to ring me about something, I already know it. Yeah. So I don't, I don't let it happen. Sure. I'm already ahead of the game. and I'm doing, Which is an amazing service. It's just not a scalable one. It's not a scalable one. My, yeah. Our business will never be... Uh, you know, a $100 million a year business uh, potentially because it does require a lot of that, uh, you know, specialization because seafood isn't something you buy in a box. Seafood isn't something that comes in a can. Mm. Seafood is different every single day. So if I'm out there promising people something, I want to make sure that it's being delivered. I can't guarantee you that what comes to me today is going to be exactly the same thing that's going to come to me tomorrow Mm. just because I trust the guy that I'm working with on the other side of the country Get it. because there's so many variables and other things and there's, you know, shitloads of stuff that goes on, uh, you know. But 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 you know what? Has anyone – sorry, man. Has, has anyone either in Australia or internationally done it where they've scaled a food service business so that it truly is turnkey and that customers are getting what they want, that, that it doesn't matter whether it's this uber-passionate – Costa or in food or service. In food service, I, I can't. I you don't can't, know of I any. I can't tell you one. Yeah, I, I don't. Know. Retail, obviously, a very different proposition. I mean, it's a totally different ball game. And yeah. you know what? It, it, even with retail, I mean, you can do many things, but can you consistently do it for a long period of time, or will you be able to do it for five years and then realize you've lost market share because there are certain things missing from? Your, your strategy or your execution. I don't know, man. People are a big thing. You have the right people, yeah. you can do anything. Yeah. If you don't have those people or you only have half those people, then somewhere down the line, someone's going to overtake you. And if they don't overtake you, you're going to lose market share. It's as simple as that. Uh, I, I'm not a business guru, but I can tell you that when your finger's off the pulse, even some of the best of us, don't always feel like doing the job properly. Mm. Even the best. I, I class myself as up there with the best in terms of how I deliver what I promise. Mm. And sometimes I can't do the job. But isn't that the problem though? That if if it's key man risk, which is you, that if that isn't duplicatable by process, whether you're sick on holidays or long service leave or retired that the business should be able to operate on its own like that's the holy grail of but, running a but, business but yes it is but who who what what's the what's the sweet spot paul how big do you want to go yeah like right. for me i i can i can i can comfortably run what i'm doing doing 30 million a year no problem yeah like i'm doing you know good money now and i'm there every day and i've got you know seconds and thirds in in charge who you know are close to to do thirty though. Do you so you're doing fifteen odd now? To do thirty, do you have to work twice as many hours, twice as hard, no, or is there some economies no, of no. scale? Of course, there's economies of scale. Yeah. Like I, my hours of working and and, and intensity doesn't change mm. whether I'm doing one million or thirty million. It's the same. I could be doing one million, and it, it appears as though I'm doing thirty. That the 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 scalability is all in and around how my brain breaks down. You know parts of the business and what I can do uh, more of in that same time and and it's all about people again and systems I yes you you that's the money shot for you mate I think I think and again man this isn't meant to be a therapy session but that you're such a hustler and you love the game you love yeah. the hustle that I think for you to step out of the business, whether it's an hour a day or half a day a week and actually go I'm gonna figure out this beast. Because there's got to be a more efficient way to do but, it, where you can you can truly unlock some of the I'll tell you unbelievable how, I'll tell value you, you've do you got. Do I want me to tell you how how to achieve that? Because I know the answer. I'm just not willing to practice it. It's a, it, a I'll, good t- I'll tell you the answer. Yeah. The answer is this: to be satisfied with eighty percent, not a hundred percent. Yeah, that's if I'm happy so true, with the business operating at eighty percent. Yeah. Which means that I'm not there all the time, or you know, I step out for that, whatever, or yeah. take a few days off, or whatever it might be. Then, if I'm happy with that, yeah. then the business will run, and it won't make it. It might not make a difference, mm. but I'm not happy with that. Yeah. I want to achieve. Yeah, most of the time, 
Kudos, as close man. to a hundred percent as I can. Kudos. What? How does how does that translate in terms of metrics for me? The amount of complaints I get from is customers less. is 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 fuck all. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. Month in, month out, and I can prove that yeah. with my that, credit returns. That's a great peace of mind. Yeah. Lateness in deliveries. I don't get any calls from chefs saying where's my delivery, and if I do, uh, it's very very rare. And there's a you know good explanation, but I don't believe in giving. Uh, uh, explanations or excuses. Fuck giving excuses. Chefs don't want to know about it. Mm. Been there, done that. Um, so there's another metric that I tick. Um, quality. I'm there. I can. You know, I'm, I, I know what I'm buying day in day out. So you know the big question is: Am I willing to compromise? To, to compromise on the twenty percent yeah. to make it happen. So Get when it. I'm ready to do that. I'll let you guys know. Yeah, please. But in the meantime, I'm just worried about you, man. It's not- <laughs> in the meantime, I'll probably get sick of not buy, being there. No, I like, just don't buy that. There's not a way to scale there is, any mate. business now, on the planet. Of course there is. Yeah. Of course there is. How, mate? Just on a, on another tack, because I I completely understand where you're coming from, and I think it's the the absolute truth in the answer. But how difficult is supply becoming, and how big a problem Very. is? seafood yep. in general. So this sort of goes back to what you were just talking about, scalability and whatnot. Why bother trying to blow this business into huge proportions when it's the product is so venues. scarce? Yeah. I you know, I can't I can't, you know, find what I need now. Is this because humans have just raped and pillaged the oceans? Yeah, obviously there's you know, there's a lot of talk about sustainability and all that sort of stuff. But you know what? I don't use that word lightly or loosely because there's a lot of heroes that want to use that word right mm. now and seem like you know they they're the caretakers of the oceans and whatever but yeah. the reality the reality is that there's a lot of controls and the, and and the fisheries are doing a lot of good things to make sure that you know fish is recovering and there was a stage 20 or 30 years ago when we'd be doing a lot of that but by default with what I do is and and it's I can be as uh caring as I want and do all the right things which I'm doing but it doesn't mean it's going to be supported by customers because you know the the, the at the end of the day dollar per kilo rains everything for it, yeah. it, it rains everything and not for everyone's now, going to pay we need to change that yeah well yeah. I agree I mean you said earlier what makes me different compromising you know the word I don't buy anything that I don't think is fit with my ethos mm-hmm. and 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 what I want to achieve, so that means dealing with some really really special people, and everybody knows who they are. I just got to get onto my Instagram account. I expose and make transparent everybody that I work with. Yep. There's no contracts in place with those guys that I deal with, but yeah, I mean, somebody said it to me not long ago, uh, and, and and I've always known this: the product is king. You have the product, you'll have customers. I don't want a lot of product. I want enough product. Um, to service those who want to buy it, and there's not a lot of them, mm. so I'll never need to worry about being 100 percent, 80 percent, because you this business will never become. There's there's a space in the market for every purveyor. Me, I, I want to be known for supplying quality, and it is sustainable by default because the people I deal with are, are catching things in a certain way that yeah. ensures that that happens. But we don't talk about it because. Do you sell anything that's farmed? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, look. How what's the, what's the split these days? And uh, I don't, I don't, I don't mean you, but in, in general, general. Look, there is no doubt that the biggest sellers by far are the farm, are farm products. The biggest, yeah. you know, whether it be salmon or barramundi. Yeah, because it's interesting, Costa, that animal agriculture, land-based animal agriculture, is so on the nose with so many do-gooders. I'll just say that, but the seafood industry kind of. You know, it, it it's just under the radar. Under the it radar. doesn't seem to get as much scrutiny. But if people really dived into what the fish were fed, how they're treated, it's, I agree. It's it's as big a problem. Would oh, you not agree? I agree. Yeah. Look, like there is a real need for farmed product. There is no doubt that we can't sustain the demand or satisfy the demand just in wild fish alone. It's impossible. Mm. I mean, most of the seafood that's consumed in this country is imported. Only a, Where you know, from primarily? Southeast Asia is a big one. Yeah, um, you Maybe. know, predominantly. Yeah, uh, but the, the 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 fresh wild product is 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 a small percentage, and and 
you know, we can't really do without farms. Mm. So I understand uh, that there's a big need for it. And we our split is probably 50-50. You know, I, I, I'd, I dare say that half of what we sell is 40% of what we sell is is all farmed and that 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 goes right down to shellfish and yeah. oysters and things like that. And and the and the rest is is a combination of you know some imported product with a lot of the wild that you mm. see you know and that's where I I, I have my biggest passion because yeah. it's do you think going forward that things like this whole food trust platform that we've been working on and, yeah. I, and I know the seafood industry is also working on that we will have consumers that go I actually will pay more but I want to know technologically wise that it is what i'm actually paying for i um i can't wait for the day that 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 notion has made an impact i think it's going to be a long time before we see any sort of changes or education towards that movement uh, because the reality is that uh, i I don't want to generalize but i think out of sight out of mind Mm. so for someone who's sitting down eating a plate of food if the price fits the criteria then they don't think about it. They yeah. don't think about it. Okay. It's such an interesting thing you say because like all this plant-based meat that's become a cryptocurrency-like yep. phenomenon at the moment that when you dig below the surface on that insofar as what are the ingredients, how heavily processed is it, what's the energy consumption to actually produce it, that if people truly knew that, they wouldn't be standing on their pedestal saying, well, you're the bad guy, I'm the good guy. And I think a lot of that is is what you're saying with seafood too, that people are still holding on to, you know what, just don't tell me about it. Yeah. But it's coming. Yeah. It's and, really and, coming, Costa. I, I mean, we want it to happen because at the end of the day, I would hate to think that the product that we buy and we go out of our way to source and the fishermen that are toiling over it uh, catching it and killing it and whatever in a certain way isn't being diluted in the mix of, you know, stuff that isn't treated that way. Mm. So, you know, it's not uncommon for chefs or for people in the retail industry to buy some good product or some sort of unique special lines and then mix dilute it, it with with stuff that's, uh, you know, generic or caught yeah. in a trawler or, yeah. or, 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 or not that not to say that there's there's not responsible trawling, but, but you know what I mean. I so, do. So that's my fear and it's not yeah. fair on on those who are doing the right thing. Yeah. Well, that's a bit like the whole organic movement that people get way too comfortable that you're eating something organic without understanding that there are some really loose interpretations of what makes a product organic, you know, uh, and it certainly doesn't mean what most people think it means. That, that, and, and how do we fix that? And yeah, where, where Technology, we- man. Like the yeah. only way to fix that is, is through technology where you literally from source through to play, you have an impenetrable... Yeah. blockchain or whatever other technology that that the the whole way through the supply chain people know that it hasn't been tampered with and the whole cold chain whether it's ever been broken what it was fed how yeah. it was killed you know it's, and it, and they're getting closer costa they really are getting and closer I, and I look forward to that day because as i said it's important to people who do go out of their way to do the right thing and to source the right product and mm. it's just a shame that it's not really broadcasted and embraced the way it should be, and you know, at the end of the day, we 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 have the obligation to push and continue doing what we do, and chefs have that same responsibility. But I don't know if you've noticed in the last few years, we were talking about in part one how a lot of those restaurants have gone from small sort of businesses or you know suburban sort of eateries to groups to, well i've noticed that it's slowly sort of coming back coming back there is definitely and, a movement yeah there, there is yeah. isn't there and and that's a good thing because that yeah. means that those restaurants and it's it's there's proof in the pudding mm. and I, you know i have customers who are operating with that same model mm. and they are the first people to jump on board with a brand new you know, amazingly caught product, and, yeah. handled well, sustainable product, and they'll put it on the plate and they'll work out how to make it work yeah. because the focus is shifting uh, not fast enough, uh, may I say, to quality ingredients yeah. and, and, and less of it. 
in order to be able to make it work. Yeah. And, and, and if that's what we have to do, then that's I what we have to do. I do think you're absolutely right that the sweet spot for hospitality is the, the smaller groups that are professionally run so they get all the efficiencies of having a, a professional operator, some economies of, of buying in bulk, but they still truly value produce like the Providence and the whole shooting match. So if you look at the Fink Group or Hubert and Alberto and – Mary's and some of those smaller but truly still the the owners of the business are the operators of the business that 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 is the future of this industry yeah I I, I totally agree with you you know um it's going back to basics isn't it back to basics uh, we're working with a, a fresh product we're working with a and I tell you that it's it's the whole nutritional quality piece you know that we talk about a lot that if we can sit there and feed somebody a smaller piece of fish or a lesser quantity of seafood or, or meat, land-based meat, and they're getting more nutritional quality from it, then if people understand that and they understand I'm getting everything I need and I don't need to have this gluttonous Western way that's making everybody fat and lazy yep. and this perverse situation where we've got a society of obese but undernourished human beings that I think that's going to slowly turn the needle because people won't pay any more by dollar. They'll just be getting less, less quantity. Of it. I mean, that, that's one that's way. That's the future, man. For sure. I, it's I the totally, future. I for totally the conscious consumer, that. That, that, that's where we need to get to. I, I, I mean, it, it's exactly how we think when we're buying. You know, mm. if, if we have to pay more for something but there's only a small amount, that doesn't deter us from buying it. We, we, we simply find the right people mm. to marry it up with and it's the same. You'll never have a big move, a massive movement yeah. in the way you're describing things. I just think that the population at large just… Asians get it though. Like the Asian influence in Australia but everywhere. Like if you look at the way the Japanese eat in particular… Yeah less but beautiful and and always the highest always. quality and you know the way the french drink like there are cultures in the world where it's not just all about the i mass. need more yeah, i get it americans and australians in particular we just want more without yeah. going it's know, a i mean it's a cultural thing it's, it's a massive educational cultural piece. thing man there's a lot of work and i think you know it won't happen straight away but a lot of the younger generation now are, are they thinking want it. Are thinking like that so yeah they're thinking so differently they're thinking you know the stuff we were talking about offline they're thinking about non-alcoholic drinks they're yep. thinking about is pot better for me than drinking they're thinking about i want to understand what's on my plate i want to understand where my clothes are made because i don't want to support some sweatshop in bangladesh yeah. and i think it's yeah. that generation that you know, that might might make that. That might make it, but change, they're coming yeah. and they're coming fast, ma'am. Yeah, you know, like a Maryvale as an example, they're now having a big chunk of their menu in some of their venues that is non-alcoholic drinks. You know, like there's not many pubs, but I think you fast forward three, even three years, but certainly five years when the food trust platform and technology like that is enabling people to truly understand what they're eating, and I think you will see that the needle has moved. Yeah, well, it's definitely something that suits us because yeah. we've always been and always will be quality purveyors. Yeah. And So this is the challenge for you, my friend, and you'll be back on many times over the next five years, but you can't burn yourself out. Like <laughs> Crazy Costa yeah. can't do Well, thank the, you for caring, Paul. No, I do care. I care a whole lot, man, because the industry needs characters like you and I think you've earned the right to have the respect of – of certainly your you. immediate customers, but I think hanging in there long enough so that the end consumer that truly appreciates what you're selling, which is quality, you know, it's no, it's it's worth you. preserving yourself. It's the only way. Awesome. Thanks a lot, buddy. Such a pleasure, man. Thank you.